If you will, turn in your Bibles to the 13th chapter, 2 Corinthians. So we've come to the final chapter now of this letter that Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And so you remember that in chapter 9, Paul finishes up talking about the collection that he is getting ready to come to administer to the poor saints that are there in Jerusalem to bring that relief. And, and after he had talked through the details on that, the next three chapters, chapters 10, 11, and 12, Paul circles back to defending his apostolic authority. He is dealing with the religious leaders that have come in and influenced uh, the leadership of the church there in Corinth, the Judaizers. They were bringing their false doctrine in. They came in with these letters of recommendation and all, and they exerted their authority, and the religious leaders started to listen to them. And so Paul is now contending with this force, with this group. You remember he said, Sends Titus ahead of himself to go and to talk to them there in the church and to get everything reconciled. And he comes back and tells Paul that, Paul, the religious leaders in the church, they're with you. They're, they're listening to you and, and the relationship is good. So now Paul is instructing them that you have to deal with these false teachers that are in the church. This is the responsibility of church leadership. And so he says, basically, if you don't deal with it before I get there, I'm going to have to deal with it when I get there. But we see these three chapters where Paul is having to equip them really to be able to contend with these false leaders and in that he compares himself to them pulls out his resume goes through these things that he says this is foolishness but if i have to do this to help you deal with the problem in the church then i'm willing to do it you saw the hurt in paul's heart the more that I love you, the less that I am loved by you. But Paul was not going to be deterred by the difficulty in their relationship. He was going to continue to press on. Love always initiates. Love always initiates a reconciliation. Love always is initiating love, relationship, and so Paul was not going to quit on them, though he was wounded and hurt by this whole exercise. As we come to this final chapter, though, Paul now is going to wrap it up, and he's excited about coming to see them, about now being able to take the church after it has gone through this difficulty, move it forward, let's, let's get going, church, let's go. And so that's Paul's you know, looking forward to his visit. He's going to close it with some amazing exhortations. Paul typically when he closes a letter will will then finish with a burst of these one sentence exhortations to the church and then he'll close it with a, a benediction. And so this final chapter, let's jump into it as Paul is looking forward to his visit there in Corinth, working through the final details of his visit. Verse 1, this will be the third time I am coming to you. And by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So Paul came in Acts chapter 18. We saw the, the visit that he made that he founded the church. Paul spent a year and a half building this church. Year and a half pouring into the leadership before he departs. And, and then on his third missionary trip, he was in Ephesus looking forward to coming over to them. And this is when the, all of the division started. And Paul has to make this second visit over, this quick trip over. It's known as the severe visit that Paul makes to try and get everything righted and departs. And now he has traveled up through Macedonia and is going to drop down to visit them for this third time. He lets them know that when he comes, that if there are any disputes or wranglings that are going to go on, that once again, it's not going to be a my opinion versus your opinion situation. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. And so 
accusations are going to have to be verified. There has to be witnesses. Rumors and innuendos and gossip are not to be dealt with, but rather that they are to be dismissed. Facts, truth, witnesses, these would be the things now that are going to be important. He says, I have told you before, verse 2, and foretell as if I were present the second time. And now, being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. So there were two issues that the leadership, he's reminding as he's kind of wrapping up and summarizing, there's two issues that the church there in Corinth needs to get on top of, and Paul wants them to deal with it before he gets there. Number one are the false religious leaders, the influence, and the Judaizers. So Paul wants them to deal with that. The second issue that he wants them to contend with was that sexual immorality that was going on within the church. And that needs to be finished and it needs to be completed. And so the church discipline with this individual and now the aspect of the moral condition of the church he says that if it's not dealt with he says then when i come again i will deal with it and i will not spare and so paul here is warning that you know, that word means to to spare in battle paul is declaring that he is not unwilling to use his apostolic authority if he needs be he says in verse 3, Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. Paul here begins by quoting their request. He, he is saying that they are asking him, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. So Paul is declaring that if you want to see that side of me, you'll remember what the criticism of Paul was. And that is, Look at how timid he is in person. Look at how weak he is when he's actually with us. Oh, he writes these harsh letters, but in person, he doesn't back that up. And so Paul says, if you want to see me back that up with my apostolic authority, I absolutely can't. They were confusing meekness and weakness. And so Paul is going to, again, make an, a, an illustration of the meekness of Jesus Christ and the meekness of Christ is never, ever to be confused with weakness. And so and Paul says in verse 4, For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. And so meekness is strength underneath self-control. It has all strength, but it is not exercising it. It is not using it. Weakness is an inability to act. Meekness is self-control, not acting by choice. And so when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he humbled himself. He allowed his own creation to crucify him. He allowed those soldiers to pull his beard, to put a bag over his head. He could have in a moment spoke them out of existence. He had all authority, all power, and yet in his humility he suffered as a lamb before its shearers. He uttered not a word. Think of the self-control, the restraint that he had to have exercised, to have allowed himself to endure such suffering, knowing that he could have delivered himself from that suffering in a second. But yet love is what compelled him to continue. And Paul would suffer long with them because he loves them. Not because he's not able to act, but he's being kind and merciful and gentle. God also is kind, merciful, and gentle in our lives. And he is long-suffering towards us. While we are yet sinning, he's still loving us. And so Paul now showing them that his meekness is not weakness, it's an attribute of Christ. And so, verse 5, he says to examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith and test yourselves. And so Paul now speaking to them about their own spiritual immaturity. Remember that the church there in Corinth, they are carnal, they are young, they are fleshly, they are worldly. They're saved, 
but they are not exhibiting spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. You'll remember in the first letter that he writes to them, he says, I would love to, to take and pull apart some meat with you, he says, but you still, you're like babes. You still need milk instead of being able to take you into the deeper subjects. And so Paul asks them now, to examine themselves as to whether or not they're in the faith. He's not asking them if they're saved. He's asking them if they are walking in the Spirit, if they are now conducting themselves as Christians. There's a big difference between Jesus Christ being your Savior and Jesus Christ being your Lord. Many people will accept Jesus as their savior. He's the I get to go to heaven card. He's the I get out of prison. I get out of hell card. And, and so I'm saved. And then they go and live their life any way they want, believing now that they are not going to hell because Jesus is their savior. But is Jesus your Lord? It's not about whether or not he's your savior. Do you have a relationship with him? If you have a relationship with him, then in fact he is your savior. But he is Lord or he is not. And so Paul is asking them, is, is Jesus Christ your Lord? Are you listening to him? Is he leading you? Is he guiding you? Examine yourselves. Test yourselves. Know this truth about you. And I think that it's a great call for each and every one of us to examine our relationship with Jesus Christ. When he says to examine yourself uh, here, that word, first of all, has a, a, a scholastic application to it in school. You will have teachers and they're communicating information and then they stop and check to see, have you learned that information now? Have, do you have a mastery of the material that we have been working on? And so it's an evaluation. Paul is teaching them and growing them in the Word of God, and he's asking them to stop and to say, are you understanding the things that, that we have been working on and that we are developing? And so there is that, that scholastic aptitude part of examine. It also, though, has the same word as used for uh, in a military sense when the sergeant will come out and have the troops line up and then he will make a military examination and check to see if their pants are creased and if their shoes are shined and if their buttons are shining and, and so this inspection. And so Paul is kind of having the church to say, stand up and let the Lord walk by the church and, and examine yourselves. How, how are we doing? How is our relationship with the Lord? Are we a ragtag bunch of believers here? Or are we decent and orderly? Are we in the faith? Are, are we a family of God that's focused and ready to be contesting against the evil that is present around us? And so examine yourselves. And, and also there is that legal sense, that same word is used to cross-examine somebody, an attorney, when they are a witness in a trial, will come and ask them questions to cross-examine and to see how solid they are in their, in their testimony. And so how solid are we in our understanding of our faith and in our testimony? And so Paul is asking them to examine themselves because it's a matter of high importance. Where do you stand with the Lord. And he says in verse 5 continues, and do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? And, and so once again, that lordship, that surrender of Jesus Christ, that he is not just a, a savior, but he seeks to indwell you and to lead you and to guide you. We invite Jesus Christ into our heart, into this relationship where we are subordinated to the will of God in our lives. He says, unless you are disqualified, but I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Paul is not expecting that they're disqualified. He's talking to the believers. But the very fact that they're a believer, he leverages that into ascertaining or declaring that I also am saved as well. 
Paul's recognition that he is the one that preached the gospel to them. And so if they accepted the gospel and they're in the faith, then guess what? Obviously the person that preached the gospel is in the faith as well. And so Paul now continues, uh, Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do what is honorable, though we may seem disqualified. So Paul is a man of prayer, and I, I pray to God that you do no evil, that you conduct yourselves uh, well, and not that we should appear approved. In other words, Paul is saying that I'm not seeking to come and to use my apostolic authority, to come and use the rod with you in order to show that I have apostolic authority. I'm not, I'm not, that's not my desire. He's paraphrasing it. I would rather you do what is right immediately in my absence, confront the sin in the church, even if that means that I lose the opportunity to demonstrate my, my authority when I get there. He says, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. In other words, our responsibility is never to oppose the truth, but to stand for the truth at all times, in all situations. God asks us that in a culture that is shifting away from truth that we would be absolutely committed to the truth and that we would be committed to it at all times in every situation that we would not waver in our commitment to uphold and to stand for the truth. For we are glad, he says, when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray that you may be made complete Paul, once again, when he says that we are glad when we are weak and you are strong, Paul here is, is declaring to the Corinthians that if his weakness or humiliation results in their being strengthened in the Lord, then he was glad. He is willing to be unselfish and to pour himself out in order that they may be exalted, that they may be complete. And that word for complete uh, doesn't mean a sinless perfection, but it means spiritual maturity, that you would come to the place of spiritual maturity. It means a wholeness. It means a solidness. God's desire for you is that you would be solid in your faith, that you would be complete in your faith. We all begin as spiritual babies. When you accepted Jesus Christ, you are a spiritual infant. And then you begin to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. The Spirit begins to mature you and you're able now to continue on to spiritual health, spiritual completeness. The word there for complete is the same word that Matthew uses in his gospel when he's talking about the call of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. It says in Matthew's gospel, chapter 4, going on from there, he being Jesus, saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. That word for mending the nets means completing the nets. It means taking the holes that they had in their nets and now completing them, restoring them, making them whole. That's the same word here that Paul is talking about. Your faith now, mending up the holes in your faith that you would be solid, that you would be strong in your commitment and in your relationship with the Lord. He says, therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. I'm writing these ahead of time to give you time to deal with them so that when I come, I'm able to come in gentleness. I'm able to come in peace. I'm able to now build into you and not be having to use the edge, the sharpness of my apostolic authority. So he likens his apostolic authority, think of it as a, as a sword. Now, a sword, a sharp-edged sword. In the hand of a surgeon, a sword is an instrument of healing as he will use it to cut out and to cut away, which is not healthy. 
by in the hand of a soldier it's an implement of uh, of devastation and destruction he says the that sword's edge that god has given to me i'm going to use it for your edification for your building up i'm not going to hurt you with it i'm not going to take and tear you down or destroy you everything that i do is to help you to grow forwards and so it's been given to me and I am happy to not use it when I come for anything other than the building up of you. And so verse 11, finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. We see Paul comes, circles back to that, that spiritual maturity, that growing up in your faith. How important that is in, in our lives that we are continuing to grow in our faith, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. How do we do that? How do we grow? How does spiritual maturity take place? Well, much in the same way that physical maturity takes place. The two key components to physical growth are going to be time and nutrition. And so if you're not giving somebody any nutrition whatsoever, then time is not going to help them. Time is going to work against them. You need time because you don't instantly grow. When you want muscles, you can't just instantly grow them the next day. Hey, I did something today. Tomorrow I should be bulging. <laughs> I would like that. That would be nice. But that's just not the way it works. And, and the same way in our spiritual life. You're going to need good nutrition. And what is the nutrition that we need? It's the Word of God. And so man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. And so we need spiritual nutrition. Now you cannot have spiritual nutrition once a week. You can't just eat physically once a week. You can go to an all-you-want buffet, all-you-can-eat buffet, and you can they eat one giant meal, but that's not going to cut it for the whole week. You can't just do that once a week. You need a steady source of solid nutrition. It's true physically, and, and in fact, Physically, God wants us eating three times a day. Not even the once a day, but multiple times in the course of a day. That's our physical nutrition. And with that nutrition, we can either be eating junk or we can be eating healthy. There's a, a constant flow that we need and then there's a quality of what we are eating. Spiritually, it's the same thing. You can be reading fluff and just, you know, looking at different things and spiritual quips and TikToks and those kinds of things, uh, or the Word of God, the Word of God. And so the relationship that we have to the nutrition of the Word of God, transform your, your mind through the renewing uh, of your mind through the Word of God. And so the Word of God is what washes your mind. Your mind is being conditioned by the world that is around you and wants you to think the way that they think. And the Word of God is trying to teach you the way that God thinks. And so we need that balance. And so and here Paul says, become complete. Become complete. Spiritual nutrition is so absolutely critical to your spiritual development. It is a component of both how long you've been walking with the Lord because experiencing your faith, testing your faith, growing in your faith, those are all parts and pieces that take time. And then good nutrition, reading the Word of God, reading the Word of God, reading the Word of God. And so here Paul tells them, become complete continue to chase uh, after uh, that, become complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. And so Paul begins this final portion with these 
exhortations to be complete, be of good comfort, don't feel condemned. Paul has given them some strong admonitions, but here he wants them to receive them, not as criticisms, but as instructions for them to be able to to grow. I'm not telling you these things to make you feel bad. I'm telling you these things so that you can grow forwards and be of one mind. The enemy seeks division. God constantly calls us to unity, 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 and so be of one mind. But where does that one mind come from? Well, the one mind for us as believers comes from the mind of Christ. You see, we're the body of Christ, and the body has one head, and that head is Christ. And so what we seek to do in walking in unity is easy. We live in such a fractured culture today, and everybody's got their opinions, and now everybody's opinions are supposed to be equal because there's no such thing as truth. So if we remove truth and no one's right or wrong, then everybody's opinion is equal, and now we have everybody just giving their opinions and expecting that their opinion has equal weight to truth. This is where we have slid off of the rails in one aspect, but... The reality is this. We as a body right here are not going to debate every single different issue that there is. We simply need to ask one question. What is the Lord's opinion on it? And whatever the Lord's opinion on it, he is the head, and so that is our opinion. And when we all take on the Lord's opinion, then we're absolutely unified in that. That is true in our marriages, in our homes. It's not what you think or what I think. What does the Lord have to say about it? And the Lord, the Word of God, has an opinion on basically every single issue that we are being contested with in our culture today. There isn't a situation or a circumstance that the Word of God is not going to have either a direct ruling or it's going to have the principles to follow that give us the direct ruling on it. It's very, very easy. And so when we all walk surrendered to the authority of the Word of God, then we're going to walk in unity. Be of one mind. And so we see the, the unity and the importance of unity because without unity, you can't live in peace. You're going to have divisions and contentions and, and everybody is going to be fighting with one another and God doesn't want that in our lives. And so the God of love and peace will be with you and, and God is the one that's leading us into this unity. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And in the ancient days, the kiss was a form of greeting and a, a gesture of, of love, but this is a holy kiss, which means that the love that we are expressing to each other is God's love that I am greeting you with. I can greet a complete stranger with God's love. And so that's why it's a holy kiss. Now, back in those days, just so you know, the men were greeting the men, the women were greeting the women. So the men weren't running around giving holy kisses to women. So, you know, that, that wasn't happening here. And that holy kiss is just, you know, it's just the cheek thing. It's not even really. We, today we would call it a holy handshake. You know, that's the, you know, it's the need a little space here, you know. So all the saints greet you. Paul, again, is showing them that you're part of such a bigger, bigger picture. The church body is a part of the church of the United States, and the church of the United States is just one country and of all of the churches that are on the face of the earth. We are so much larger than just uh, our own little fellowship or gathering. Paul is trying to help them gain a bigger perspective on uh, on their faith, all the saints uh, and greet you in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And so here Paul closes with this glorious benediction. Notice here that the Trinity is referenced in this uh, single verse. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons that make up the Trinity. And once again, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but from Genesis to Revelation, we see that the principle of the Trinity is taught in the three persons 
that make up the one God but are separate in their personalities. We see this also throughout the scriptures. Now, what is interesting and what does jump out at you when you look at this verse is normally we see that the theological divine order is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But here notice that in this application or in this verse we see the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And the reason for that is that Paul, it is believed, the scholars suggest that Paul is talking about the way that we experience God, not about the theological authority of God. That a person first uh, connects with God through Jesus Christ. That it is the grace uh, of our Savior that then connects us to the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So we experience Jesus Christ first as our Savior. That connects us now to the love of the Father. The Father is the fountainhead of all blessings. And so the love of God flows through Jesus Christ onto us. And then as a believer, the work of the Holy Spirit spirit begins in our hearts and in our lives and so experientially as a believer we are going to come into the grace of jesus christ first by grace you've been saved that not of yourselves and so we're going to experience the grace of our savior who was sent by the father and then the experience of the holy spirit in our lives and so paul closes his letter and and so how did it go? What's the end story on the church in Corinth? When Paul comes, do they have a, a good visit? Do they not have a good visit? And, and so I want you to know that, uh, that the Corinthians, they respond positively to this letter and, and also to Paul's uh, visit. We see that you know, he followed the writing of this letter with a visit. He spends three months there. Remember, he wanted to spend the winter there. So he comes comes down, he spends the winter there in Corinth and builds them. And it is from Corinth that Paul then sits down during that winter time and he writes the book of Romans. And so the book of Romans was written from Corinth after this letter and during that visit that he makes. And, and so Paul in chapter 15 uh, of the book of Romans, he says, now there is uh, no more place for me to work in these regions. And and so Paul now got the church headed in the right direction, and, and now he is going to uh, head back. His desire, most people believe, was to then head to Spain. But you'll remember that as he brings the love gift back to Jerusalem and is there in the temple for the feast, that's when he gets arrested and then to Caesarea and then imprisoned in Caesarea, ultimately finds his way to Rome. And, and whether or not he ever got to Spain or not is a, is a question that we'll have to ask him when we see him. But uh, scholars have different opinions on that as well. As we close our our study here on this chapter and on the book of Corinthians, it's back to verse 11 that I really just wanted to touch on for a minute before we conclude. And finally, brethren, he says, farewell, become complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. That, that is the, the quality of life that God desires for us, peace. That your heart would be at peace. That your life would be at peace. And it begins first with that peace with God. The knowledge that our sins are forgiven and washed away and removed, and as far as the east is from the west, that they have been contended with. And, and that now... You don't have to be afraid of standing before God. Because you're going to stand before God, not in your own righteousness, but you're going to stand before God robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the righteousness of Jesus Christ is a perfect garment. And so we will be acceptable to the Father. And so we have peace now with God. God is for us. God is with us. God is going to lead you and guide you every step of the way. And His desire for you is to be able to take and to cast all of your cares on Him 
for he cares for you. What is the condition of your heart today? Are you at peace? Or are you struggling? Do you wake up and struggle with anxiety? Do you wake up and struggle with stress? Do you wake up and struggle with pressure? Does your to-do list seem to be a mountain that you can't climb? Are you waiting to be happy? You know, I'm going to be happy as, as soon as I get past this illness that I've got right now. You know, I'm going to be happy as soon as our finances just loosen up a little bit and I, I can breathe. I'm going to be happy as soon as our kids or grandkids pull it together and I have to stop worrying about them. And, you know, I'm going to be happy as soon as. And, and, and what we do is, is our hearts are not at peace we're waiting for a future event or events to take place before we're finally going to be able to just go, ah, all right, I'm happy. Or is that a carrot that just keeps on moving and just keeps on moving and I just keep on chasing and I just keep staying in this frantic pace of, uh, of living with all of these cares and concerns and God asks you to take your backpack of rocks and set it down and go play with the rest of the kids on the playground. Be at peace. Trust the Lord with how much of your heart? With all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he's the one that will direct your steps. He wants your heart to be as calm as a lake at sunrise when there's no wind whatsoever. And the surface is so flat and so perfectly calm that it's a perfect mirror and you can see everything in the water as if it is just this absolute mirror. I want you to know that in the scriptures, the world, the typology of the world is the ocean, is the sea. And that's because the sea is never at rest. The waves are constant. They're ceaseless. They're endless. The water is always moving. It's always choppy. It's always rolling. You will never see the ocean flat like a lake. And the world pulls us into the waves and the cycles and the rhythms. And, and God says, stop. Get off the ride. Be at peace. Be content. Be content with what you have. More stuff is not going to make you happy. Relationships are what matter. We're in the Philippines. One of the, the greatest things about going to third world countries it, is that in third world countries, when you're around people that have not, and they know that they have not, Putting food on the table on a daily basis is a, is a struggle. They're a have-not. They're not trying to build heaven on earth. They know that there's just no, that's not even in the realm of, of possibility. They don't have anything. They don't have possessions. They don't value possessions because there aren't possessions to have. Do you know what they value? Relationships. That's what they value. And, and so their hearts are so open. They're so ready to connect. They're so ready to make friends because their security in their life is by the number of relationships that they have. Here in our country, we don't collect relationships. We collect stuff. And we value stuff. And we have little regard for relationships and, and for others. When 
God has made us to be relational. When Jesus was asked, what's the most important of all of the commandments? He said, oh, that's easy. Collect all the stuff that you can. <laughs> that's the purpose of life right there. And Keep it shiny, <laughs> shinier than your neighbors. <laughs> no. He said it's all about relationships. It starts first with your vertical relationship. Love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your, of your strength. Learn how to have a successful relationship with God. I believe that you will never have a more successful relationship with anybody on the face of the earth than you will with God. See, when you're in a relationship with God, He's perfect. So you're in a relationship with perfection. So anything that's wrong with your relationship with God, guess whose fault it is? <laughs> See, you've isolated the variable for the first time in your life. You can't say, it's them, they're the problem, you know, I mean, and if they would just do this, this, and this. How often do we try and fix our partners, our marriages, our, uh, by telling them what they need to do? And if they... See, if you were just more perfect, <laughs> then I wouldn't need to be so perfect. <laughs> you just make it easier to love you by doing this, this, and this. And, but you see, our relationship with God, we're in a relationship with perfection. This is where God teaches us how to have a successful relationship. And then we can start to practice it with imperfect people and learn how to love the imperfects after we've learned how to have a faithful relationship with the one who is always faithful. We learn how to love by responding to the one that's always initiating love. We learn how to grow our heart, our capacity, our trust, all of these things with the one that guarantees that he's for us and will never hurt us and harm us. And though he will allow us to go through things that we can't understand, he promises us, just trust me, I will work it together for good in, in your life, in your heart. So let's go. You're not alone. I don't want you to figure things out for yourself. I'll help you with every single one of your problems, with every single bit of your confusion. Now can you be at peace? For the first time in your life, can you just... Breathe. Can you just enjoy this world that I gave you to play in? Can you start to notice the sunrises and the sunsets that I paint for you every single day? Every single day I'm busy creating a masterpiece for you and you don't even look at it. You're too busy worried about all of your stuff in your, in your life. Can you listen to the birds? Can you listen to them sing? I put them there for you to sing for you and to enjoy. Are you enjoying this incredible experience that I gave you? Or are you shoving everybody out of the way and trying to get on top and trying to collect more and worried you're going to lose it all? And, and, and Be at peace. You're okay. God loves you. It ends well. <laughs> Your last breath here, you're stepping into the most glorious existence you can't even imagine. And so, let's just get back to loving. See, all your stress, all your worry, all of the, it takes you out of the game of just loving. Just love God. And love others. Some are going to be easy to love. Some are not going to be so easy to love. Some, I think, are almost impossible. <laughs> you know? But uh, he, he's going to help us to love all of those categories and we get to exercise learning and growing and becoming complete in our faith as we're able to take God's love through us onto others. But get your heart calm as a lake on a sunrise without a breath of wind. Be at peace. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. God, we ask that you would just continue to help us and 
make it so, you make it so simple, Lord, but we need your help. It's simple, but we're not able to do it on our own. And so, God, help us to live in peace. In peace that passes understanding, that guards our hearts and our minds. And so, Lord, we just thank you. Help us today before we even leave the sanctuary this morning to cast all of our cares on you, to leave it right here today, to take it off, set it down, and walk away from it, and trust you with all of it. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.